Okay, so hello and welcome to Gas Heating Bootcamp Session 1. I am Eric Scheidel, your host, the HVAC Service Mentor. And for those of you who are uh, new to the HVAC Mentor experience, uh, let me say welcome to class. Thank you for coming. And uh, let me introduce myself. Um, I started in HVAC uh, almost 20 years ago as a maintenance technician at a large uh, residential HVAC contractor. And uh, it didn't take me very long to figure out that I had stumbled upon something that I really loved, I really enjoyed. And um, very quickly, I was determined to start learning everything I could about everything about what this business was. I really loved the aspects of, of uh, troubleshooting, uh, traveling, meeting people, being in a new, uh, several different places every day, and uh, always being presented with challenges. And I sought to tackle those challenges and conquer them and understand them. And I was continually sleep challenged because the challenges never end. There's always something new to learn, something new to explore, uh, some new hidden secret that you didn't know before. And I, I really enjoyed that. And I began first teaching uh, back when the uh, Chronotherm 4 thermostat was first introduced. And that thermostat offered capabilities that no other thermostat ever had before. And our team had some challenges with that. Our sales team was um, selling them like gangbusters, and the installation team was putting them in, but didn't fully understand all the features and how they worked and how to set them up correctly. So then the service department had to go out and try to figure it out, and they were equally challenged. And it was really kind of a tough deal. And uh, the uh, service manager said, is anyone going to volunteer to figure this darn thing out and give everybody a class on it so that we can all learn it? And um, I volunteered and uh, found out I really liked teaching, too, and I was uh, quite good at it. And so that began my career as a uh, technician trainer and service mentor uh, to all the junior technicians that were coming through that company. And fast forward uh, almost 20 years later and uh, changing locations from one state to another and um, working in many different companies also in that same kind of a leadership and mentor role. And here we are now. Um, now I am very privileged and thrilled to be able to do uh, teaching and mentoring full time and bring this to you in this uh, brand new internet platform which has been working fantastically to be able to serve people from all over the country in the United States and Canada. So welcome everyone to Gas Heating Bootcamp. Um, this is session one of six sessions and um, each session is going to be approximately three hours long. We will take a, a bit of a 10 minute uh, leg stretch break about halfway through and then uh, reconvene and uh, move on through the end of the material. So let's get to it. Uh, make sure you have your handouts in front of you and you can follow along. Uh, take notes as necessary uh, or take as many notes as you can, actually. Uh, not everything that I say is necessarily going to be in your handouts. Uh, from time to time, I will um, point out specific things. Say, this is something you really want to pay attention to. Uh, this might be on the test. Uh, and something like that. That's something for sure that you're going to want to write down, uh, but lots of other things as well. And ideally, when at the end of this course, you will have uh, six booklets that can all bound together into a book form, and that will be your reference manual that you'll be able to refer to again and again into the future. Uh, so as I said, my name is Eric Scheidel. Um, if you aren't familiar with HVAC Service Mentor, you can learn a lot more about it right here on the Internet at my website at www.hvacservicementor.com. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, find out about more classes, ask about uh, anything like that, you can reach me uh, by email at eric at hvacservicementor.com. So what will we be discussing in today's lesson? Uh, first and foremost, we will learn about the different types of fuel gases and their properties. We'll learn about combustion theory. And this is kind of ground zero for uh, gas-fired heating and air conditioning system service. Combustion theory is incredibly important. We'll learn about the different types of gas burners uh, that you will find out there in the field 
how they uh, function and how they are different from one another. And you will learn about the different types of draft systems uh, found in the most common types of appliances uh, that you will run into the field. And the burner type and the draft types uh, somewhat go together. And so we will talk about the similarities and the differences between them and talk about how those components work together to function in an actual uh, gas burning appliance. So let's get started with types of fuel gases. Primarily there are three types of fuel gases available. Uh, the first is natural gas. Uh, natural gas essentially is methane, and you might want to write that down, that natural gas essentially is methane. Uh, methane and it, natural gas is essentially naturally occurring methane. The second is propane. Uh, propane, just like you would go down to the corner um, gas station and get a jug of propane for your barbecue grill, uh, we also have propane uh, for use as a heating fuel in homes and buildings. And this is primarily going to be utilized in markets that do not have the gas piping infrastructure to support natural gas burning. And the third fuel gas is butane. Now, butane as a fuel gas really isn't used in uh, space heating applications. But whenever you are looking at a textbook about fuel gases or anything having to do with fuel gases, these three fuel gases are always discussed and we're always talking about butane. But butane is really only utilized in what I would call a portable appliance. Uh, something as simple as a um, handheld cigarette lighter or, or grill lighter, uh, or um, you can even find some uh, portable gas burners that you can use as a cooktop that use a, uh, a butane canister that will screw in, similar to your Coleman stove, only powered with butane rather than propane. But butane really doesn't have much of a purpose in um, commercially available heating fuels. And the reason for that is butane is a very heavy fuel. And it has a, it will condense into liquid fairly easily, which makes it pretty difficult to move it through a network of pipes. It wants to turn into liquid pretty, pretty easily at a, a relatively high temperature. And uh, that doesn't make for a good fuel gas. We want gas, not liquid. So uh, after the next couple of slides, we're going to stop talking about butane altogether. But we're really kind of going to kind of look at that uh, as a comparison. Now, one of the interesting things to notice, and we will talk about the source of these gases in just a minute, but all three of these gases come from the same place. They are all pretty much found in the same place together at the same time. So the uh, natural gas is found at the same time and place as propane and butane. They're all naturally occurring together uh, in real different quantities. Now, the reason that we use fuel gas is to extract heat energy. Heat energy is measured in the United States in units known as BTUs. And BTU is an acronym. It stands for British Thermal Unit, BTU. If you live in Canada, or if you live in Europe, or if you live in Mexico, you may be using different units of measurement because uh, very frequently many other parts of the world will use the metric system, whereas the United States is still stuck in the English imperial system of measurements. Here in the US, we measure in, in pounds and ounces, and feet and inches and miles, and uh, uh, when we measure heat energy, we measure it in British thermal units. If we were in, uh, say, Canada, we might measure distance in kilometers or centimeters, and uh, we might measure weight in grams and kilograms, and we might measure heat energy in calories or kilowatts or uh, some other form of measurement. But basically, we have to have some unit of measurement of heat. And heat is difficult to pin down because you can't hold a bucket full of heat energy and put it on a scale and weigh it, and you can't take a tape measure and measure it or anything like that. So we judge heat energy by the effect that it has on something else. So that's something that the gold standard, if you will, is water. So one unit of heat energy, one British thermal unit, is the quantity of heat required to raise one pound of pure water, one degree Fahrenheit, at sea level. 
Now, there's a few things that are important there, pure water being one of them. If we add salt to the water or other minerals to the water, that will change that water's response to the addition of heat energy. Uh, if we change the altitude from to above sea level, that will also somewhat change its response to heat energy. Not a whole lot, but it, it may change. So this is the definition of a quantity of heat. Honestly, not all of that helpful. <laughs> the important part from this message is that heat energy is measured in units known as BTUs, and that gas fuel, or fuel gas, contains heat energy inside of it, trapped. And to extract that heat energy, we burn the stuff, and we set it on fire. And then that heat energy comes out. So different types of fuel gases have different amounts of heat energy trapped inside of them. This is why we need to study the different gases. If we're looking at natural gas, also known as methane, Natural gas, one cubic foot, and uh, gas is, uh, in the United States is typically measured in cubic feet. One cubic foot of natural gas at sea level contains approximately 1,075 BTU of heat energy. 1,075 British thermal units at sea level. Now off to the side on your um, handouts here, I'd like you to make an additional note. In general, the amount of heat energy contained in a natural gas, in a cubic foot of natural gas, ranges somewhere between 950 BTU per cubic feet and 1100 BTU per cubic foot. Depending on where you are, depending on your natural gas provider, and the uh, unique circumstances of their delivery infrastructure system, your gas may have somewhat more or somewhat less BTU per cubic foot. Also, based on your altitude, this will also change. Remember, this is at sea level. As you change in altitude, um, one cubic foot has fewer gas molecules in it than a cubic foot at sea level does. Therefore, it will also have less heat energy. We're not going to worry about altitude so much because uh, we're going to pretend everything is at sea level, just to keep everything on a level playing field, if you will. As a result of this variation between 950 and 1100 BTU per cubic foot, when we are doing rough back of the envelope type calculations, we generally consider that natural gas has 1000 BTU per cubic feet, or per cubic foot. So I'd like you to write that off to the side. Uh, one cubic foot of natural gas rounds off to average 1000 BTU per cubic foot. And that's pretty much the standard. Most of your uh, natural gas utility providers are shooting for that caloric value of heat content in the gas. And by the way, if you wanted to call up your natural gas provider, which I recommend you do, as a heating and air conditioning technician, you are intimately involved in gas fuels. It's a good idea for you to know what is the heat content of the fuel gas in your market. So call up your natural gas provider and ask them. And what you will ask for is the caloric value. That's C-A-L-O-R-I-C value. Remember, calories are also a measurement of heat. So um, ask for the caloric value of your gas, and they will give you a number of BTU per cubic foot of their gas supply. Ask them, too, if it's different between the winter and the summer. Some places are. Some places have winter gas and summer gas, just like gasoline. So find out about that. Cool, uh, good stuff to know for your local marketplace. But for the course of this program, uh, we will consider that natural gas has 1,000 BTU per cubic foot, because that's the average, and that's what your utility providers are striving for. It's also what your... Um, what your um, gas appliance manufacturers factor in when they design machinery. One cubic foot of propane, by, co uh, by comparison, contains 2,570 BTU at sea level. And we'll round this off to about 2,500. So you can write that off into the side, round that off to about 2,500 BTU per cubic foot. Once again, if you are in a propane marketplace, different propane suppliers maybe supplying different types of gas 
at different locations. So it's a good idea to call up and ask the propane provider what is the caloric value of the gas that they're providing. And sometimes it may change from time to time. Good to know. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that and when we get more deep into the propane side of things. Butane, by comparison, one cubic foot of butane contains 3,260 BTU at sea level. So about 3,200. Check that out between propane and natural gas. Remember, we're not, we're not really too worried about butane, but propane and natural gas, propane has about one and a half times, sorry, about two and a half times the heat content per cubic foot that natural gas does. It's significantly more BTU per cubic foot than natural gas does. So now that we know what the BTU content is, let's look at flame temperatures. Those of you who um, have been in some of my other classes, you know that I'm fond of the phrase, BTU and temperature aren't the same thing, and that holds true when we're talking about fuel gases as well. Natural gas flame is going to be somewhere between 1,700 and 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that is a general st statement. When we are talking specifically about fuel burning appliances in a residential or commercial application being used as a heating fuel, I'm really being specific because I want to differentiate between other uses of natural gas in industrial applications, such as in forges or um, kilns or welding or flame spray type operations. Um, that's a whole nother story. But in space heating and uh, process heating applications in residential and light commercial applications, our natural gas flames are going to be in the 1800 to 2000 degree neighborhood. So write that down in this vicinity, 1800 to 2000 degree flame temperature for natural gas. Let's check out propane. Propane uh, flame temperatures are in between 2200 and 3100 degrees Fahrenheit. In that same application that I just discussed, uh, heating applications for uh, space heating and process heating, um, we're looking at flame temperatures down in the 22 to 2400 degree range. This is interesting. Remember I said BTU and temperature aren't the same thing. Propane has about two and a half times as much caloric value that natural gas does. However, the flame temperature certainly is not two and a half times higher. It's absolutely not. It's a little bit higher, but really not a whole heck of a lot higher. Um, the reason for the difference, and I, uh, I equate this to heating with wood. When I was a boy uh, growing up in rural Wisconsin, Heating with wood was common. Almost everybody had a wood pile out behind their house, and uh, there was a lot of people, you know, where you are, there's probably a lot of HVAC contractors. Where, where I grew up, there was a lot of uh, firewood suppliers, wood cutters. And a, a lot of folks would actually drive out into the forest and cut their own wood and haul it home and, and heat their homes with that. That was very common. And we were always looking for high heat value woods, such as oak uh, was the best. Oak was by far the best. Uh, poplar, not as good, but readily available. And pine, very low heat content and not really something you want to be burning in a fireplace because of the creosote, but also because it had a very low heat content. Ideally, when you're heating with wood, you'd like to put a log in the fire and not have to mess with it for hours and allow it to burn and continue producing heat, and oak would do that because it was a very dense and heavy wood. Whereas poplar, it would provide heat, but you had to give it more and more and more, and it would turn to ash very quickly. This is similar to the difference between heat, uh, propane, and natural gas. Propane would be your oak. Natural gas would be your poplar or your aspen. Propane is a denser molecule. There is more, physically more to propane is a, on a molecular level than there is natural gas. So as a result, it has more heat energy in it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it burns at a higher temperature. It means that it will essentially burn longer, or as it burns, it will reduce, release a larger number of BTU, heat energy. 
So bear that in mind as we go move forward and talk about natural gas and propane and the differences between them. Properties of natural gas, first of all, it's lighter than air. As a result, it mixes with air quite easily. And in the event of a leak, it will float to the top of an enclosure. So uh, as a result, we tend to say that uh, natural gas is a little safer than propane. Um, we'll talk about that. It'll, it'll mix with air. It will dissipate into the atmosphere fairly quickly and easily. Any winds or ventilation, it will get rid of it, get it out relatively easily. Natural gas is delivered to its end, uh, final destination point or its final point of use under pressure from a utility provider through a network of pipes, generally underground. It will pass through a pressure regulator and then a meter to uh, count the amount of gas that's being used before it goes into a home or a building. If it is a residential application, it is going to enter the house in general and all across the country at a pressure of seven inches of water column. You're not familiar with the measurement of inches of water column. Inches of water column is a measurement of pressure and it means the height that that pressure will push a column of water. So a, uh, a, a amount of pressure at this much, seven inches of water column, will push water up a column seven inches tall. To give you a comparison to pounds per square inch, which uh, most folks are a lot more familiar with, such as the tire pressure uh, in your car or your bicycle or refrigerant gauge pressure, we measure those in pounds per square inch, PSI. And that means the amount of the equivalent pressure of a weight pressing down on one square inch surface. One PSI is equal to 28 inches of water column. So therefore, the pressure that natural gas enters a home after the regulator is around seven inches water column, or one quarter of a PSI. So the pressures that we're working with of natural gas are very low, especially inside the building. Pressure in the pipes is very, very low, generally a quarter of a PSI in a residential and a light commercial application. When we get into commercial applications, that pressure is going to be significantly higher. And it can be as high as 2 PSI. Uh, it can even be as high as pressure in the teens or some other pressure. Um, in commercial applications, uh, natural gas lines that are greater than 7 inches of water column must be labeled. And they may be labeled with a label that says such as uh, medium pressure gas. Medium pressure gas normally means two pound uh, gas, or it may be labeled with um, with a uh, actual PSI that's in the pipe. So be aware of that. If you're on a commercial job, look for those yellow and black labels and see what the pressure in the pipe is. We do have a, a verification question here. The question is just to check: one psig equals 28 inches of water column. Yes, that is the measurement. One PSI equals 28 inches of water column. Those of you who are in the boiler basic training class will find very particular interesting when we get to the water pressure side of things. Propane, a little different. Propane is heavier than air. Remember when I said that propane has a, a more complicated molecule? It's a more dense fuel. There, it's also heavier than air. And as a result, it will pool at a lower level in case of a leak. This makes propane uh, potentially more dangerous than natural gas. It does not mix with air quite as easily as natural gas does. Now, that doesn't mean to say that it is hard to mix with air, but it's not as easily mixed with air as uh, natural gas. So as a result, it can pool into a concentration near the floor. And if you're working with a boiler, which is low to the ground, or water heater, which has a burner and ignition source low to the ground, that can create a explosion hazard pretty easily. As a result, 
codes require there to be a gravity drain uh, to the outdoors and some other regulations regarding uh, propane installations to uh, promote the safety of this fuel gas. Now, unfortunately, many propane installations are in rural areas. Uh, many rural, er rural areas may not have a um, code authority having jurisdiction that's going to come and do inspections. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very common, especially here uh, in the West where I live, where uh, remote rural uh, customers and communities pretty much just do their own thing. And we call it out here, we call it cowboy engineering, because on the western, uh, on the, well, on the eastern plains of uh, Colorado, uh, it's where all the cattle ranchers and the cowboys are, and they kind of do things their own way. So there's definitely something to be careful of. Is uh, gravity drain to the outdoors in the IFGC is a, uh, is a question here. I believe it is, but don't quote me on that. I have a copy of it here, but I haven't actually looked that up. I do know that uh, my local authority having jurisdiction uh, does uh, hammer that pretty hard. And uh, I do believe it does come from the IFGC. And um, But yes, I'm going to say yes, um, but I will double check at the break uh, just to be sure. They also have things as far as clearances, where the, where the fuel source goes, where the lines goes. Lots of other things as well. Um, yes, that is IFGC. But I'll double check. Uh, that gravity drain to outdoors is going to look just like a floor drain, just like a, a wastewater drain. But in fact, it'll be a two inch PVC pipe that will go from the floor, under the floor, sloping downward to the outdoors and where that uh, uh, propane will naturally flow out and go to the outside. Um, but hey, what if you have a gas appliance in a basement or a crawl space that's below grade? You're not going to be able to get propane to slide down the drain. It's not going to go up to the outside, and that's correct. In those types of applications, there needs to be a gas sensing device, a, a, essentially a stationary gas sniffer that's connected to a safety switch. The safety switch is connected to a solenoid valve that's on the main gas line. And that solenoid is powered open at all times. Unless the gas sniffing device senses the presence of flammable gas, then it will de-energize that solenoid valve on the main gas line, stopping the flow of gas into the structure. So all of the gas appliances will go down at the same time. That is one of the first things you want to be aware of and look for when you are in an area that does have code enforcement and um, you are uh, rolling up to a house using propane gas and none of their gas appliances work. It's the first thing you'll want to look for. You'll go to the lowest point in the building, either basement, crawl space, and find that um, propane gas safety shutoff device. And be careful because there's a darn good chance that it responded like it was supposed to, meaning there's a leak in the system. There's a leak somewhere. So don't be having cigarettes or don't be using your torch to, or a lighter, a lighter way. Be careful of sparks and uh, use your nose because there's odor in, the, in those gases. This is something that is often not done, by the way. That's what I mean out there in the rural areas. They may not have been aware of that code requirement and uh, may not have been done. So when you're out servicing appliances in those areas uh, that may be rural, uh, look for that. If you're in the uh, on the eastern seaboard or in New England, where a lot of traditionally oil-fired equipment is being converted into propane um, to avoid the high cost of fuel oil in some cases, uh, look for that as well there's a good chance that that may not have been added in, and a lot of those homes have dug basements. So uh, check for that and add, offer to upgrade that. And check with your local uh, wholesaler, ask them if they have propane safety shutdown devices, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to tell you all about them. Propane is stored in liquid form in a pressurized tank outdoor, and it enters the home at a much higher pressure than natural gas uh, in the 12 to 14 inches of water column pressure range. So where does this stuff come from? Where does natural gas come from? 
Uh, in fact, I think I'm going to pause here for a second, uh, see if we have any uh, questions, and uh, we'll address them if there are. Okay, no extra questions, but I did take a second and look up the um, uh, LPG, liquid propane gas uh, regulations in the International Fuel Gas Code, and yes, it is all throughout the International Fuel Gas Code, including uh, propane vehicle fueling stations, natural gas fueling stations, and gaseous hydrogen storage systems. Uh, anything you'd ever want to think about fuel gases is in the IFGC. So thank you for that question that came up. So where in the heck does natural gas come from? It comes from the ground, naturally. Uh, it comes right out of the ground, and this is a natural gas well. Uh, those of you living in uh, the western United States and uh, some parts of the Midwest are very familiar with these structures dotting the landscape. Um, anywhere there's oil, generally there will also be natural gas. Uh, sometimes there's more gas than there is oil, and sometimes it's the other way around. And this is where both uh, propane, butane, and natural gas are all found together in the well. I got the click, here we go. This is a wellhead from a natural gas well, and uh, all uh, this apparatus is involved in bringing that gas right up out of the ground. This is literally stuck into the ground, down however many hundreds or thousands of feet to the gas pocket, piping it up and through into those, uh, into those larger tanks. This diagram here describes the distribution system. Over on the left are those wells. Once it gets out of the well, it goes into a separation process where oil and water are separated from the fuel gases. From there, it goes on to a gas processing plant where uh, the individual components of methane, propane, and butane are separated from another, one another and treated separately for sale and distribution. Any non-hydrocarbons that are present in this gas are removed. They're returned to the field or they're vented off with a, with a flame. This is why you'll frequently see a standing flame in a lot of these facilities and installations. They're burning off some of the gases that they can't use or don't want at that time. From there, it goes to a compressor station, very similar to refrigeration compressors, only a lot more of them and a lot larger, and that increases the pressure of the gas to send it on down the line. From there, it gets del delivered up and sold or stored into an underground reservoir. When it will finally become utilized and, and purchased by a natural gas utility provider, that is when an odorant is added to it. And uh, odorant is not naturally found in natural gas or in propane. These gases don't have a natural odor of their own. They add a smelly substance, and the substance added to natural gas is called mercaptan, which is spelled M-E-R-C-A-P-T-I-N, mercaptan. Mercaptan is that rotten egg smell or that weird propane smell that I don't know how to describe propane smells like, they add these odorizers to the gas so that they can be easily detected uh, in the event of a leak. Otherwise, they could be present and nobody would even know, and that could be pretty dangerous. From there, the gas company gets it and sells it through their piping distribution network to their end users and their customers. Now, being that, uh, that I live in, in the West, in uh, Colorado, which is, uh, 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 which is a um, uh, oil and gas producing area, I had a unique opportunity to run into a gentleman that works in uh, this segment of the industry right here, from the blue tank to the left. And um, he works for a company that builds these specialized refrigeration systems because fuel gases are hydrocarbons and they behave a lot like refrigerants. And these refrigeration systems cool the gases that come out of the well, causing them to condense at specific temperatures. And this is how they separate the gases from one another. Butane condenses at a relatively warm temperature. It's the heaviest gas. So they will run a process at a warmer temperature to condense out the butane, separate it out. Then they'll run the process at a, some, at a next lowest temperature and condense the propane, separate it out, 
and then they'll do the same for the natural gas. We do have a question in the box. The question is, does the additive change the BTU rating? The natural gas providers that put in the additive, they may also put in other agents with the natural gas to deliver it to the end user. And some of those additives can change the BTU content, which is why I mentioned earlier the difference between summer gas and winter gas. For example, in, uh, in my location, our gas lines aren't buried very deep uh, to get from the utility provider to the homes. They're not buried very deep at all. Our frost line doesn't go down very deep. Our winters aren't that cold in my town. But those gas lines do tend to get cold, and uh, sometimes the gas wants to try to liquefy or have issues moving down the lines. So as a result, in the wintertime, they will add certain additives to help prevent that uh, process and allow the gas to move more freely down the lines. They always try to make sure the mixture is getting as close to that 1,000 BTU per cubic foot as they can, but different utility providers have different situations that they're working with and therefore different processes that they will subject the gas to, and that can and does affect the final BTU content. Not a whole lot, though, because remember, the gas appliances that are burning that gas, um, they're going to freak out, right, if they have a widely varying BTU content in, in the gas delivered to them. So they're going to try to keep it the same. But the answer to your question, does additives change BTU ratings? The answer is essentially yes on a basic level. But the utility providers work very hard to make sure that the end result that you receive at the end of the pipe stays pretty consistent. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you for that question, by the way. So let's start talking about natural gas and how it enters the home. Here's where we start, at the meter. And I want you to take a second and look, have a good hard look at this picture. See if you can find anything wrong with this picture. What is wrong with this picture? If you have a guess, type it in the chat box. <laughs> we got a good one. It's locked. Yeah. There's a lock on it. Look to the left, lower left of the corner here, and this is the supply valve coming from the utility provider, coming from essentially what I call coming from the street. Those gas lines are buried in the streets, and then they branch off to go to the residences. So this is line coming from the street, and that valve is closed, and the valve is locked with a special locking fitting that the utility company provides. So either this is a brand new installation, which has not been leak tested and approved for release yet, or this is an existing installation and the, um, the customer hasn't paid their bill. If you are a service technician and you run across one of these locks on the meter, uh, leave it alone. Do not attempt to remove it yourself. All of this stuff that is in this picture is property of the utility provider. And fiddling with any of it is a really good way to get on their bad side, which as a HVAC uh, heating technician is not a place that you want to be. You always want to be on the good side of the utility provider. In fact, uh, we generally work in partnership with the utility providers to ensure that uh, the public stays safe when using uh, natural gas appliances. So if that lock is there, it's there for a very good reason, and you will find yourself in hot water pretty quickly if you attempt to remove it. And um, that's why you don't have a tool to remove that. It takes a special type of a key or tool uh, to get that little plug off of there. The little red, um, red deal right there isn't really what locks it in place. That's just there to indicate if it's been tampered with. Uh, so don't think you can just simply snip that and slip out the plug. It doesn't work that way. It actually requires a special key to get it off. 
And you might be thinking, I got a hammer, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, and you'll find yourself in uh, uh, not good graces uh, if you use that. So if you find that, call your local utility provider and uh, have them come out and find out why the heck is that thing locked out, and can they please come and take it off as soon as possible. They say, well, as soon as they pay, then yes, we can. That's the end of your day really, at that job site, right? You're gone. A couple of things to pay attention to. That gas comes in on the left from the street, and the first thing that it runs into is a pressure regulator. This donut-shaped looking thing here is our natural gas pressure regulator. Now, the pressure that is in this line can vary widely from location to location. Where I live, the pressure that's in this line in some parts of town can be higher than 100 PSI. That is super high. You do not want to be fiddling around with any of these fittings that are under 150 PSI gas pressure. If something were to happen and that stuff starts leaking that quickly, especially down upstream of the valve, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So pretty much just leave all that stuff alone. The only thing over here that you can mess with or, or work on is the shutoff valve right here. It's a quarter turn type valve. You will need a big crescent wrench or channel lock pliers to operate it, but you will use this valve to shut off the gas supply to the building if you're going to be doing any work on the piping or replacing appliances or doing anything like that. This is where you will kill the gas supply to the building. That is the only thing that you can really do out here. Now, up in the upper right hand, from this union fitting right here at the outlet of the gas meter to the right, that's customer-owned property, and you can do whatever you want on that end. But if you need to run a new gas line, say you're going to install a brand-new tankless water heater, you will most likely need to run a new gas line for that. And the best way to do that is to install a T-fitting where that elbow is and run your brand-new gas line from there on in. If your new gas requirement for that building is now greater then what the meter is able to provide, most utility providers will replace the meter for free with a larger model that will handle the new gas supply. This is really important when adding on things like um, um, tankless water heaters. The smallest tankless water heaters generally in use in a home for the whole house use have an input rating in the 199,000 BTU range. Adding a, that, that can be like the BTU capacity of a whole nother house. And a lot of existing gas meters may not have the capacity to supply that much gas. So if you're adding a, uh, another appliance or you're adding a spa heater or you're adding a tankless water heater to a home, call the utility provider before you're done and say, hey, I am over here at such and such a place at such and such a Mr. and Mrs. Smith, tell them the customer's name and tell them, I have added an appliance, and now my entire BTU load, uh, add up all the BTU input of all the appliances in the home, now my entire BTU load is this. Does your meter have the capacity to supply that much gas? And if the answer is no, it does not, say, well, uh, you may want to talk to Mr. and Mrs. Smith and schedule a trip over here to replace their meter, and chances are they will. Of course, check with your utility provider. That is their job. Let's talk for a second about regulators, though. The job of the regulator is to reduce the pressure from whatever the utility provider has in their line down to the pressure that will be used in the home. And if this is a home, it'll be seven inches water column. If it's a commercial building, it may be significantly higher than that. It is this regulator's job to produce that pressure. If the pressure in the building is not appropriate, this is most likely the source of the problem. Once again, avoid the temptation to make any adjustments to this because that is a really good way to get in trouble with the utility provider. Uh, as an experienced gas heating tech, someday you may say to yourself, I can adjust a gas regulator. Uh, that's true as long as it's owned by the customer. It's owned by the utility provider. Leave it alone. Ask them to come, please come and adjust it, and they will probably be more than happy to do so. All regulators have a vent. All regulators will provide, produce a constant outlet pressure that is a certain amount higher than the atmospheric pressure. So if the pressure that that meter or that regulator is controlling to is seven inches of water column, 
What that really means is seven inches of water column higher than the atmospheric pressure outside. The vent, which in this regulator is right down here at the bottom, is exposing the regulator to atmospheric pressure. So it always knows to send out seven inches of water column greater than whatever the pressure is right here. As a result, through the normal operation of the gas regulator, a little bit of natural gas can and will escape from that vent. So it is normal to be able to smell and detect natural gas in this location. If you are responding to a complaint of a natural gas smell outdoors near the regulator, be aware that if you're finding that gas right here, first of all, a little bit is normal. A lot is not normal, and that deserves a call to the utility provider. Second of all, you also want to pay attention to the union fittings on the regulator itself. Those fittings have rubber gaskets in them, which can and do crack and corrode. So if you have a uh, leak over here at the, one of these unions, call that utility provider. Avoid the temptation to tighten it. You will probably make it worse. Call the utility provider. And if in doubt, just call them anyway. Say, hey, I'm seeing a leak out there. They'll tell you whether it's normal or not, and let them do that. That's their call. That's their stuff. Any question on natural gas meters before we move forward? All right. Propane. Whole different delivery system in propane. Comes on a truck like this one. And that's a pretty one. I like how new it is. There's not even any mud on the tires. But that is a propane delivery truck. A propane delivery truck is going to deliver liquid propane into a receptacle similar to this outside of the home or building. In some instances, that tank may be buried underground, uh, but in most residential and light commercial applications, you'll find it sitting outside just like this one. Uh, I remember when I was a, a little boy, um, uh, it was a lot of fun for me to throw rocks at propane tanks that my neighbors had or uh, a propane tank at the church. You know, church gets out and you're a jittery little boy, you're bored, you want to run around and throw rocks at the propane tank. And I was always kind of nervous because I knew there was explosive gas in there that maybe if I threw a rock at it, it would explode. But that didn't stop me from throwing the rocks anyways because I thought, well, heck, that would be really silly if they set something outside that just anybody could hit with a rock and it would blow up. So I didn't believe it would happen, but I was always a little worried that it would. It never did. Thank goodness. What I didn't realize, however, you can see it in this picture here. This little crooked-looking pipe that's coming out from the dome in the top of the tank, that's actually the uh, propane supply line. And that one there is usually copper and not all that hard to damage. And so if you are doing propane service work, not a bad idea to look at the tank, not a bad idea to look at the condition of that pipe and make sure that some local kid hasn't been throwing rocks at it, causing damage to it. Not, uh, not uncommon to see that happening. Now, propane is very similar to R22, refrigerant 22. Uh, those of you that work in air conditioning systems are aware that uh, refrigerants have a pressure and temperature relationship. So when they're at a certain pressure, they're at a certain temperature when they are in saturated form. Liquid propane is essentially saturated propane. And propane refrigerant uh, is a very similar temperature and pressure relationship to R22. So if you're familiar at all with your R22 PT chart, you can pretty much take the outside temperature and know what the pressure in the tank is. So for example, if it's a 95 degree day outside and the tank is in the shade at 95 degrees, that tank is going to be under a pressure of somewhere in the 190 range, 190 to 200 pounds. A lot of pressure in that tank out there. If it's sitting in the sun accumulating heat, it can be much warmer than that and therefore be a much higher pressure. That's why the gas line is so small, because it's under such a high pressure. That, that, that line right there is probably no more than a 3 8 or half inch soft copper line. Um, I just lost my train of thought there. Pressure, tank, high pressure, yes. As a result, in the winter time, if you're in a very cold, cold, snowy climate, the pressure in that tank is going to be much lower. Still going to be a higher pressure, but much lower than it is in the summertime. 
This is very important to know. Propane systems have a series of regulators involved. And um, how these, where these regulators are and how they are set um, is going to be different in different applications, especially how far is that tank from the house and how big is the line going from the tank to the house. The smaller the line, the higher the pressure needs to be. The longer the line, the higher the pressure needs to be. So there's a primary regulator right on the top of the tank, boom, right there, right underneath that little dome. And that primary regulator is going to step the pressure down from whatever that super high pressure in the tank is to a much more reasonable level. Uh, somewhere in the 14 to 28 inches of water column range. If that is a very long, uh, if there is a very long run and a very small pipe, that pressure the, controlled by that regulator may need to be higher. Once the uh, gas gets to the house, there will often be another regulator right on the outside of the house where that line enters the building. And then from there, it will divide up and feed all of the appliances. Alternatively, there may not be a regulator at the outside of the house. And instead, each appliance may have its own regulator on it. Now, there is a question in the chat box that says, what is the distance from the house that the tank needs to be? Is there a requirement? And that is, once again, coming to us from the IFGC. The answer is yes, there is a requirement, and what that requirement is depends on where is the property line, because there needs to be a distance from the house and a distance from the property line. There needs to be a distance to a public right-of-way, uh, and also depends on how big is the tank. The larger the tank, the greater the distances need to be. So that will be found in the IFGC, and it may also be amended by your local code authority having jurisdiction, however they see fit based on the local conditions in your area. So I encourage you to check on that. So yes, there is a requirement. If you're doing new construction or if you're doing a conversion from, uh, say, fuel oil to propane, you're going to need to know those regulations. Uh, the fuel oil to propane is, can sometimes be a tough one, a lot of fuel oil tanks live right in the basement near the uh, oil burning appliances. And now the propane tanks are going to have to go possibly somewhere else. Uh, so ask your authority having jurisdiction and they will be happy to advise you. So because of this, uh, because of this um, interesting pressure uh, deal, you may find different things in different types of applications. Uh, in fact, I have seen some houses plumbed for uh, propane gas exclusively in 3.8 soft copper because they were using relatively high pressure gas. They didn't need a very big diameter pipe. Uh, this also leads us into the commercial side of natural gas things. That's why commercial gas lines are generally higher pressure because if you have to go 100 yards on a large building from the point of where the meter is to the point of use of where the appliance is, and you're going to run all of that gas in uh, seven inches water column. Keep in mind that commercial applications are going to have a higher gas demand. You're going to end up with a four inch gas line. Or if you run that gas under two pound or five pound pressure, you can result in a one inch gas line instead to deliver the same amount of fuel under higher pressure. In that case, there will be a gas regulator at the appliance to step it down to that seven inches water column that the appliance needs. Most all fuel burning appliances that you'll find in a home or a building uh, will operate at that seven inches water column pressure rating. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. So we're gonna uh, move from supply and delivery to combustion theory. And this is going to apply pretty much to both propane and natural gas. And from now on, we're going to switch to uh, speaking pretty much exclusively about natural gas. Uh, natural gas is the premier main fuel source in most of North America, and the propane is, is definitely in the minority. So we're going to leave propane uh, where it is now and move on to primarily speaking about natural gas. All of the concepts we're going to talk about, however, do apply pretty equally to propane and natural gas. So gas combustion. This image on the screen right now is known as the combustion triangle. 
And I first got introduced to the combustion triangle when I was in grade school. And the way it was introduced to me was the fire department uh, came in and were talking to us about fire prevention and fire safety and what to do if there is a fire and how to put the fire out. And they introduced us to the fire triangle, combustion triangle. And the way it's explained is that uh, combustion uh, requires three things to exist. And those three things are oxygen, heat, and fuel. And if you want to put a fire out, if you remove one of those three things, any one of them, the fire will not be able to exist. Uh, so when we dump water on the fuel, we smother it and we remove the heat and the oxygen pretty much at the same time. Or if we remove the fuel by turning off the gas supply, uh, we will stop the combustion. Uh, there again, too, if we uh, smother, put water on it, it won't be hot enough and it won't sustain itself. So uh, good stuff to know if you want to put out a fire. Also really good stuff to know if you want to start and maintain a fire, which is what we are all about, right? You want to start fire. Uh, raise your hand to yourself if you uh, first got really intrigued in this business because they but they told you you could play with fire. That was it for me. Uh, that sealed the deal. When I found out I was going to play with fire, I was like, yes, sign me up. Show me where to go. I'm all about the fire. When we want to start a fire and maintain a fire, uh, these are the things that we need. This is critically important. When I work with service technicians, both junior technicians and very experienced technicians alike, and we're having a problem. They're having a problem figuring out a gas heating issue. And it's one of those stumpers, one of those difficult ones. You've got to go back two or three times and configure it out. It almost always comes down to one of these three things. So this is, not, is very basic, but it's very important. It's very easy to overlook uh, in the field. So remember that when you're stumped, chances are you're going to be looking for a problem with one of these things. Either your oxygen supply isn't good enough, you have a heat issue, or you have a fuel issue. That oxygen is going to come from air. We're not using a natural gas and oxygen torch. We're using an air and natural gas mixture. Air is about 20% oxygen. So there's a lot of other stuff in air that we don't really need to support the combustion process. If we could just do straight oxygen, we would, but we don't have to because there's enough oxygen in air to support combustion. So our oxygen is going to come from the combustion air supply. So we need to think about air whenever we're thinking about burning gas. It's so easy to focus on the gas. We've got to focus on the air, too. So let's look at combustion. One cubic foot of gas needs air to burn. How much? It needs eight cubic feet of primary air. Eight cubic feet of primary air contains enough oxygen to sustain combustion. But in an actual gas burning appliance, eight cubic feet of air is not enough. Primary air, as we just assessed, the eight cubic feet of primary air enters the burner along with the gas right at about the same place. As the natural gas is being delivered under pressure, and it's a very low pressure, but as it's being delivered under pressure, it bridges this gap as it's on its way down the burner tube, causing air to be drawn in and mixed with the gas. This mixing of air with fuel uh, causes there to be a combustible mixture. Without that air mixture, gas will not burn. If that mixture is too lean, as in not enough air to mix with the fuel, it won't burn. If it's too rich, excuse me, too rich would be too much fuel, not enough air. If it's too lean, there's too much air and not enough fuel, it won't burn either. It has to be a very specific mixture of fuel to air to create a flammable mixture. And all of our burners are shaped and sized and designed to create that specific mixture when the fuel is delivered at that specific pressure. And we'll talk about what that pressure is a little bit later. That fuel, that air is drawn in to mix with the fuel, and it does so, and it is able to sustain a flame down at the end of the burner. There's additional air that joins the party, however, and that's called secondary air. We need an additional seven cubic feet of secondary air. And a good question to ask is, Eric, if the eight cubic feet of primary air contains enough oxygen to sustain the combustion, why do we need the additional seven cubic feet of secondary air? That's a good question. That additional seven cubic feet 
joins the flame already in progress at the end of the flame down here. So there's more air traveling in and being drawn into the combustion process naturally in this direction. Remember that air only has 20% oxygen. The remainder of air, the extra 80%, is primarily nitrogen. Nitrogen is an inert gas that doesn't mix with anything, it doesn't react with anything, and it doesn't burn, it doesn't sustain combustion. But it's there. When we have a, a, a fuel cloud of fuel gas plus oxygen plus nitrogen, what is going on is that fuel gas is trying to combine with the oxygen. But there's so much nitrogen there that it is getting in the way. It is physically in the way, preventing oxygen and fuel gas from coming together. So additional air is allowed into the flame to give even more oxygen. So there, there is an overabundance of oxygen so that hopefully all of the fuel gas molecules will find an oxygen partner to bond with. And that's the idea. If it weren't for that extra seven cubic feet, it'd kind of like be a game of musical chairs, right? When there's a bunch of nitrogen sitting in some of the chairs and it's in the way, and the oxygen doesn't have a chance to join the party and sit down. So that's why we give even more air to get an overabundance of oxygen. So if we could get rid of all that nitrogen out of the system, that wouldn't be necessary. But we're working with air, so it is necessary. So as a result, we need a baseline of at least 15 cubic feet of air for every cubic foot of gas that we are going to burn. Remember from before, what is the caloric value of natural gas per cubic foot? How many BTU will be released when one cubic foot of gas is burned? I'll answer for you. Remember, it was about 1,000. 1,000 BTU per cubic foot. When you look at the rating plate on your fuel burning appliance, such as your gas furnace, and it says that that furnace is, say, 100,000 BTU per hour. Gas input rating, 100,000 BTU per hour. What that really means is that appliance is designed to consume 100 cubic feet of gas per hour if it runs steadily. If that gas has the appropriate 1,000 BTU per cubic feet, that equals a 100,000 BTU per hour furnace. That's also a 1,500 cubic foot of air per hour furnace. That's a heck of a lot of air, and that air has to come from somewhere. And that is why the uh, fuel gas code and also the mechanical code has such a strict requirement on combustion air supply. It's very, very important. If we don't have the right combustion air supply, our flames, our gaspers aren't going to perform correctly. Here's a really cool thing to get deep in your head about combustion. Fire is a chemical reaction. Fire is a chemical reaction might be on the test. What's taking place is essentially a rapid oxidation of the fuel. Think about oxidation. Um, can you think of any other examples that you might run into in your life where you're going to experience oxidation of something? I come from originally, I come from Wisconsin. And Wisconsin is a part of the country that is also known as the Rust Belt. We get a lot of snow in the winter. They put a lot of salt on the roads to try to melt the snow. The salt rusts the uh, bodies of cars and, and steel. So we're very familiar with rust up there in, uh, in Wisconsin. Rust is oxidation of iron. It's an iron oxide. And when steel is being rusted, what's essentially happening is the steel, or the iron in the steel, is combining with oxygen. Oxygen reacts with it and produces a chemical reaction, and that chemical reaction has a product. Something else is created. 
So we have iron plus oxygen combined to create a completely new substance called iron oxide, also known as rust. Fire is essentially fuel gas rusting very, very quickly. Fuel gas is combining with oxygen. As that happens, the molecules of the fuel gas, molecules are comprised of atoms that are held together with an energetic bond. When, that, when oxygen is introduced, that energetic bond is broken, and the components separate into their individual parts. And those individual parts will then join up and recombine with oxygen. Those energetic bonds that hold those molecules together, when they are broken, the energy that was formerly holding them together is now released. That is the heat energy that we are after. That is the 1,000 BTU per hour per cubic foot. That is why propane has more BTU per cubic foot than gas does because propane is a more complicated molecule. It has more parts being held together, therefore more and a stronger energetic bond that when it is broken, that energy is released in the form of heat energy, and that's what we are after when we go through combustion. Coincidentally, in chemistry, there are certain chemical experiments that you can do, combining, say, an iron with an oxygen source to create uh, iron oxide, and it happens very quickly. Rusting normally takes time, it's slow, but these chemical reactions happen very quickly. And when they happen, the solution gets warm. You can feel it in your hand. It's the same thing happening, those energetic bonds being broken, that energy manifesting itself as heat, random heat or free heat, free radical heat, if you want to think about it like that. So the next time you're staring into the flame of a gas burner, realize that this is essentially what's going on. And that essentially what we're doing when we're tuning a gas burner is optimizing this chemical reaction or optimizing chemistry. When I was in high school, I literally failed chemistry. And I never dreamed that I'd be working with it uh, later in life. But here we are. So I think that's pretty neat. Just like when iron and oxygen combine together to create a whole new product, when we are burning a fuel gas, there is a whole new product created, and we call this the products of combustion. And as heating technicians, we need to know what those products of combustion are. They are incredibly important to us. So the first product of combustion, in fact, the most important one, the one that we're after is heat, as we just discussed. Heat is a product of combustion. Light is also a product of combustion. It's interesting to notice that the reason fuel gases are fuel gases, the reason why they are explosive, the reason why they make good uh, material to burn is because the energetic bonds that hold those molecules together are relatively uh, small. They're fairly easy to break and get that heat out. By comparison, the energetic bond that holds wood together is much stronger. It's much more difficult to get wood to burn than it is to get a gas to burn because of that molecular bond. When those bonds are broken, most of that energy is released in the form of heat, but some of it is released in the form of light, which is why you can see a flame and why flames used to be used to light homes and buildings and street, uh, streets. Uh, gas lighting was the first use of gas fuel. Before it was used for heating, it was used for lighting in, uh, on the eastern seaboard. Gas lights, lamp lighter. You've heard of like lamp lighter lane or something like that because someone would have to go and light the gas every night to give street lights. And carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, where did the heck did that come from? Well, gas fuel is a hydrocarbon. It contains carbon. Primarily, gas fuel is hydrogen plus carbon. When they break apart, you've got carbon. When carbon combines with two oxygen molecules, one of the results is CO2, or carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is one of the main byproducts of combustion. 
The other main byproduct of combustion is water vapor. Remember, gas fuel is a hydrocarbon. It contains hydrogen. We take a hydrogen. Uh, actually, this is wrong. I keep meaning to fix this, and I apologize. So please fix this in your books. Write this down. It's two hydrogen plus one oxygen equals H2O, also known as water. Under conventional combustion, this water remains in vapor state. In the flame, we are literally combining hydrogen plus oxygen, creating water vapor in the flame. But it's water vapor. And it's, the flame, of course, is a very high temperature, so that's way above the boiling point of water, so that water stays in vapor form. However, when that combustion product, when that flue gas cools, that water vapor will turn into water droplets and then it will start to run out of places. This is why on a cold day in the winter you see exhaust gas coming up out of the furnace flue. You can see it as a cloud because that uh, water vapor hits that cold atmosphere outside and it, boom, turns into water droplets. It turns into a little cloud. In warmer weather, that doesn't happen because the water stays in vapor form when it hits the atmosphere. It doesn't cool down as much. This is also why condensing appliances work. Condensing appliances such as furnaces and water heaters and boilers that have a uh, annual fuel efficiency rating greater than 90% will have a water drain because they are extracting so much heat from those flue gases, they will cool to the point of condensation and that's intentional. In other appliances, condensation is not intentional. And condensing in, say, a brick chimney or a metal flue will lead to extreme corrosion and failure of that flue and of that vent. Very important to realize that water vapor is present in gas combustion. And if you see evidence of water vapor or liquid water in a flue in a place where it shouldn't be, you have an issue. And uh, that's something to go after. So very important to realize water vapor is a normal and natural byproduct of natural gas combustion. In fact, almost any combustion is going to have water vapor as a byproduct. Now, the other one isn't necessarily a product of combustion, but a result of combustion, and that's excess air. Remember earlier when I said we give the uh, combustion process additional air more than it really needs to ensure that every oxygen molecule has a dance partner that it's able to hook up with? Well, the air that was not involved in the combustion process is going to go right on through the combustion process, literally unchanged. And that's going to be all of our extra nitrogen and uh, that extra 15 cubic feet, uh, 7 cubic feet of air that wasn't required to combine with fuel gas, but we just wanted to make sure that the fuel gas had more than enough. This is important to realize that excess air is there because when we're tuning burners, too much excess air it's just going to go right on up the flue. But instead of, it's going to be heated by the flame. The, all the heat energy from the flame, we would like to get it in, into our conditioned space that we're heating. If we have a large amount of excess air just going straight up the flue, all of the BTU that it's taking with it are not able to be realized as heat in the house. That's going to lead to an inefficient operation of our burner. We'll burn nice and cleanly because we'll have more than enough air to burn, but are we getting all the heat value out of that gas and putting it into uh, the water of the boiler or into the air of the forced air furnace? No, we're sending a lot of it up the flue. So we got to have the right amount of air for combustion, but not too much excess air because that's going to lead to fuel inefficiency and higher operating costs. So that was normal combustion. What about when there's a problem? We don't always have ideal circumstances. So let's look at some incomplete combustion results. First of all, carbon monoxide. We're going to talk more about carbon monoxide in one of our uh, future lessons. But first, for right now, let's be aware that carbon monoxide is a colorless and odorless poisonous gas that kills or injures thousands of people across America every year. And uh, we are really on the front lines of that. Keeping our burners burning cleanly is going to minimize or eliminate the production of carbon monoxide. Remember that uh, uh, 
carbon dioxide is produced when a carbon and two oxygen uh, link up together. Well, if we don't have enough oxygen present and uh, only one oxygen combines with the carbon, that's carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide, good in the flame. Carbon monoxide, not good in the flame. Another product is called nitrogen oxide, also known as NOx. You may hear talk about NOx filters or low NOx burners. Uh, NOx or nitrogen, NOx is essentially a generic term for a family of gases called nitrogen oxides, and there are several of them. Remember, nitrogen is an inert gas, but in a unstable flame, oxygen will combine with nitrogen and create an oxide of nitrogen, and that is a poisonous gas and a known air pollutant. And uh, tuning our burners is going to minimize the production of nitrogen oxides. Sulfur dioxide can also be produced. Uh, this is a poisonous gas and non-air pollutant. It's an active contributor to acid rain. Now, uh, the actual production of sulfur dioxide from a natural gas flame is, is very, very low. Uh, sulfur dioxide is more commonly associated with coal fires than natural gas fires. However, uh, sulfur dioxide can and will be produced in a very poorly burning uh, natural gas flame that has a very poor fuel and air mixture. So just something to be aware of. Straight up carbon can be a, a product of incomplete combustion. Natural gas should burn very cleanly. There should be no soot or residue left behind. But if we have a situation where we are severely inadequate in the oxygen supply, severely inadequate combustion air supply, the amount of fuel being consumed, this is going to cause free carbon atoms to be left remaining at the end of the combustion process. And they're just going to be floating around, sticking on stuff, leaving behind a black soot deposit. If you look at a natural gas burning appliance and you see black soot near the burners or in the combustion chamber of that appliance, you have a serious combustion problem. If it is so starved for oxygen that free carbon atoms are being left behind, you are also going to produce an awful lot of carbon monoxide. So you know immediately you have a very dangerous burning flame. A burner should not be left alone and should not be allowed to continue operating that have evidence of carbon soot taking place. It is an extremely dangerous situation and you definitely cannot allow, allow that burner to continue operating. So where does incomplete combustion come from? Well, not enough combustion air supply is one good source. Not built to code. Um, too tight a construction. Uh, somebody put a door in the, a box in the boiler of the furnace and put a door on it and doesn't allow enough air to come in. Misadjusted burner. The air shutters close too far. Uh, too much fuel delivery. That's, a, that's an adjustment that we are in charge of. Dirt, lint, or spider webs in the burner tubes. That's something that's cleanliness. We need to keep these burners clean. The burner out of place. Remember our fuel triangle? Remember the heat side of the fuel triangle, or the combustion triangle? If your burner is supposed to be pointed like this, and the flames are supposed to be pointed upwards, and the whole burner tips to the side, and its flames are pointed to the side, and those flames are burning on a metal surface, that metal surface will reduce the flame temperature. It's a process called flame quenching. When flames impinge on a metal, impinge on a metal surface, we get incomplete combustion, very high carbon monoxide levels as a result. And of course, that's our jurisdiction, right? We control uh, the alignment of the burners. Inadequate draft through the appliance. We'll talk about drafts in the second half of our program today. That can cause, be caused by a clogged flue or a clogged heat exchanger or a flue passageway inside the heat exchanger. Dirty combustion blower wheel might be spinning fast enough to make the pressure switch, but not fast enough to adequately draw the combustion products through the appliance. Inadequate draft, uh, oh, and we just said that, can also be caused by uh, uh, flue gas recirculation. This is more common in... Um, 90% furnaces where the uh, combustion intake and the exhaust are right next to one another. And if flue gas is allowed to be drawn into the intake, now we are going to have polluted combustion air, air supply. Contaminates such as uh, dirty fuel, uh, dirty combustion air supply, uh, this is especially important in propane markets to realize. 
sometimes your propane provider might start getting their fuel from another source. And um, we have some issues, I know, in uh, certain parts of eastern Colorado where high efficiency boilers were working fine for a number of years. And then all of a sudden they stood it up and they wouldn't run correctly anymore because something changed in the fuel gas delivery system. Uh, we started getting some impurities in the fuel and uh, it caused those burners to you know, operate incorrectly. So uh, at this point, this is a good break time. I am going to uh, uh, take about 10 minutes and uh, we will reconvene. Okay, everybody, welcome back from break. Now we are going to take a little bit of a turn. Uh, we've covered the basics of uh, fuel gases, their properties, and of uh, fuel gas combustion. And now we are going to move into the different types of burners and appliances that we are going to find these concepts uh, applied in. And the first, uh, the first appliance we're going to look at is called a direct fired burner. And direct fired burners are most commonly found in our HVAC world. They're most commonly found in the V part of HVAC, ventilation, specifically uh, kitchen and range ventilation. Uh, and also in, uh, we'll also find them in um, swimming pool areas and natatoriums, as they're called. In these areas, we have a significant amount of exhaust happening. Uh, take a kitchen, for example. The kitchen has an exhaust hood over the grill or over the fryer, over the griddle, and that is uh, moving smoke and grease and steam and heat from the grill area and exhausting that outdoors. That is a significant volume of air that's being moved, and that air has to be replaced. So we bring in a make-up air unit. It's going to make up for all of the air that's being exhausted. Makeup air unit and exhaust fans are linked together so they both operate at the same time and we get a circular effect. As air is being exhausted, fresh air is being brought in from outdoors. Uh, sounds great. In the wintertime, that air can be extremely cold. Uh, below zero if you're in uh, parts of North Dakota and uh, Montana and Minnesota uh, and other places. Very, very cold air. And that will very quickly freeze the kitchen or freeze an area uh, solid. So we cannot have just cold air being dumped in. So we have to heat that air up. And one of the easiest and uh, quickest ways that that is done is with the application of a direct fired burner. Direct fired indicates that there is no heat exchanger. The fire is directly in the heated air stream. So all of the products of combustion are heating the air that's being brought in. That air is being brought in in such a significant volume that complete combustion is almost completely assured. There should never be a problem with not enough combustion air. In fact, if you remember our flame temperatures on natural gas being in that 1800 to 2000 degree range and realize that makeup air units are generally going to be providing a supply air temperature of about 70 degree air, you realize that there is all kinds of outside air uh, being brought in to uh, provide both the combustion air support supply and the air stream for the makeup air. Some jurisdictions do not allow direct fired burners because they are concerned about combustion products building up in the atmosphere, uh, but they are very, very common in uh, wherever that they are allowed because they're economical, they're very effective, and in general, they're incredibly safe as well. So this would be what we would call a direct fired makeup air unit. One of the things to be aware of about direct fired units, which makes them a bit more complicated from a service standpoint, and that is the makeup air unit is controlling to discharge air temperature. So say we want to control the temperature of the air coming out of the unit at 70 degrees all the time. When the outdoor air temperature is 70 degrees or warmer, there's no demand for heat. But as the outdoor air temperature falls, we need to operate the burner in order to maintain that 70 degree air temperature. Now it's not practical to have that burner cycle off and on to try to maintain air temperature, because otherwise we're gonna get warm air, colder, warm air, colder, warm air, colder, as that uh, burner cycles on and off. 
Instead, the burner is modulating. And a modulating burner has been in use on direct fire appliances for, for generations, essentially. So uh, the, the thermostat looks at the discharge air temperature, compares it to what the discharge air temperature set point is, and then it modulates the firing rate of the burner accordingly. So say, for example, it's 60 degrees outdoors, and the discharge air temperature set point is 70, it will modulate the flame to be a very, very low, small flame, uh, only the amount required to raise that air temperature 10 degrees as it passes through the, the, through the unit. In the dead of winter, say, for example, the outside air temperature is zero degrees, now it will modulate the flame to a much higher level, a much stronger flame, to uh, warm up that air 70 degrees as it passes through. So modulating burners are very common in direct fired appliances. And if you uh, are in a market where you work on uh, maybe working in a lot of direct fired appliances, if you work in the uh, restaurant and food service field, I strongly recommend you um, get some additional training and education in modulating burner controls as applied to direct fire appliances because it's a whole other topic of discussion, much different than your standard uh, boiler or furnace uh, or water heater type of gas controls. The next burner we're going to discuss is the atmospheric burner combined with a natural draft appliance. Let's talk for a second about draft. What the heck is draft? And you might want to write some notes on this page about draft. Draft isn't something that's really firmly understood as far as what exactly draft is and where it comes from. Draft is essentially a suction. It's a sucking force. The flue pipe is going to be pulling through at all times. All natural draft flues are under negative pressure, which means they are pulling product out of the house and into the outdoors. The flue gases will be pulled through the heat exchanger. And this is important to realize because it is very common to assume that because flue gases are warm, that they rise up on their own naturally. Well, that's partly true but primarily what happens is the flue gases are pulled out of the heat exchanger. They don't raise, they are drawn, hence the name draft. They are pulled right out. And if conditions are not such that that sucking or that pulling action exists, there won't be a good draft. If there isn't a good draft, it's very difficult to get a good mixture of fuel and air and that is why we said earlier, one of the main causes or primary causes of incomplete combustion is a poor draft. There are a lot of factors that contribute to draft, uh, which we will kind of touch on as we move forward. An atmospheric burner with a natural draft, let's talk about the draft side first, um, requires additional air above and beyond the air required to support combustion. The 15 cubic feet of air required for combustion still exists. However, there is additional air that needs to be added to help create and sustain the draft. It's called dilution air. I said that incorrectly. Let me back up. Dilution air does not help create and sustain the draft, but dilution air is drawn in because of the draft, because of that suction. This is one reason why natural draft appliances are no longer commonly produced, uh, except in water heaters, and those are probably going to be going away soon, too. Natural draft appliances have an opening at the top to allow this dilution air to come in, and I'll get to the reason why dilution air is there in a minute. Because the flues are constantly under a negative pressure and they're constantly sucking, they are constantly drawing in air up the flue pipe. That air, if it's in the conditioned space, has already been paid to be heated, and it's going to be drawn right at the flue at all times. And that is a condition that we would like to stop that leads to an inefficient energy-wasting structure. 
Remember earlier when we said that water vapor was a uh, common and normal byproduct of combustion? Well, that's true. It's also true that when the combustion products, or the flu products as we like to call them, cool to the point where it reaches the dew point of that water vapor, condensation will occur in the flu. And that can lead to rusted out flu pipes. If the uh, flu is uh, made of brick or masonry, it will corrode and eat away the brick and the masonry. Even if it's a clay tile liner, it will corrode that liner. Uh, the, uh, the combustion products and the water vapor associated with that are slightly acidic and they will eat away stone and masonry products. Dilution air is added to those flue products to essentially lower the dew point to, cause, to mean condensation is going to be less likely to occur. Um, natural draft appliances need this dilution air coming in, otherwise it would always be raining in the flu. We've got a great question here. What causes the negative pressure that draws the exhaust upwards or draws the flu products up through the flu? What causes that negative draft? And that is a great question. The draft is initially established through a phenomenon called the stack effect. If you take a pipe, stick it straight up in the air, and you make it long enough, it will automatically start drawing upwards. If, it, if, one, if the bottom end of it is inside of a building and the other end is outside of a building, this will create what's known as stack effect. A couple of things contribute to stack effect. If my flu is uh, standing straight up and down like this, up in the air above the house, and wind is coming across it in this manner, that is going to increase the amount of draw on the flu as air moves across the top of that pipe. Stack effect is related to what is known as Venturi effect, and this action here is primarily known as Venturi effect. Venturi effect is also at work inside of our burners, and we're going to look at that on the next slide. But essentially, that just that stack effect from that flu being up in the air from bottom to top, being long enough, creates the stack effect. This is why the venting tables uh, are so important. The venting tables will detail for how much gas is being burned, how big of a diameter the flu is, and how long it needs to be. And that length has everything to do with the amount of draw on the flu. If you look at venting tables, you will discover that the longer or the taller the vent is, the higher it is, the more flu products it's able to pull because the stronger the draft is. So the difference between, say, a 10-foot high flu pipe and a 25-foot high flu pipe, the 25-foot high flu pipe will be able to handle more BTU gas being burned than the 10-foot high pipe will because of that stronger draft. This is good to know as a service technician as well. And here's a good story to give you an analogy about this. Uh, I went to a service call one time for a gas fireplace that was setting off a carbon monoxide alarm in a uh, condominium building. These condominiums are two stories. So there's a unit on the bottom and there's a unit on the top. And both of them have natural gas burning fireplaces with glass doors um, on them. And the upper unit was backdrafting. It wouldn't, it wouldn't vent up the flue. It would, the flue combustion product would come out into the living space and uh, they were getting headaches and there was a problem there. They bought a CO alarm and it started going off. So I come out and I find out sure enough combustion products are coming out the front of this gas fireplace instead of being drawn in by the draft. Not enough draft. And uh, what I discovered when I went outside is that the flue pipes for the bottom apartment or bottom condo and the upper condo both terminated at the same level. So the lower condo never had any problems with backdrafting because its flue pipe length was about 25 feet long. The second floor condo's flue pipe was only about 8 feet long. According to the installation instructions for that appliance, it required a minimum vent length of 10 feet. 
That's the reason why. It needed that length to produce enough stack effect to draw the combustion products effectively up and out of the appliance. So the solution in that case was to go down to the supply house, uh, get a, another section of uh, double wall vent pipe, and uh, raise the vent, make it longer. Problem solved. And um, we actually had to end up doing that in several units in that, in that building to overcome that challenge. That's the stack effect. It's a really neat natural phenomenon that happens with a vertical section of pipe going from inside a building to outside. It's a constant, constant draw. So while we're here, let's talk about that Venturi effect. This is how natural or atmospheric burners work. It's called atmospheric because the whole thing works at essentially atmospheric pressure. Gas is delivered to the burner through an orifice under pressure, under a very small amount of pressure. In fact, for natural gas, the pressure delivered to the orifice is generally three and a half inches of water column, or roughly half of what the line pressure was, so an eighth of a PSI, very, very small pressure. It's just a whisper. As gas is injected into the orifice, it's injected through what's called a venturi. This cone-shaped uh, uh, assembly with the holes in it is a venturi. And on almost every gas burner, you will find some form of a venturi. It will be, and the very simple is just a tube with a notch cut in the top of it, and the air will be drawn in through that notch. As gas is being injected into this tube, it creates a low pressure zone in the venturi, causing air to be drawn in. This is very similar if you take this whole assembly and you stand it up on end, blow air across the end of it, creates a stack effect in the flue. But this is a burner. So as gas is being injected, air is being drawn in through the venturi, and it mixes down the length of the burner tube and gets down to the other end where it is a flame. Uh, natural draft appliances utilize a heat exchanger that's essentially open on both ends. So at the bottom of the heat exchanger, burners are installed. These are, here we are, here's just a tube with an opening in it. That's a venturi. Air is going to be drawn in through those openings and the flames appear here. All atmospheric burners feature flames that point upwards. Your cigarette lighter is an atmospheric burner. Just try and make that flame go sideways. You can turn your whole lighter sideways and that flame will still point up. A candle is also an atmospheric burner, and these gas burners are atmospheric burners as well. Flames will point straight up and down. The combustion products will be drawn upwards through the heat exchanger and uh, they will leave the heat exchanger in an open area. Because the flue is under a draft and it is pulling up, it will pull those uh, combustion products up right with it, and it will also pull dilution air in from the other end up with the uh, flue products. As I said before, it's a very common uh, thought that the heat of combustion causes flue products to rise up. And to a minor extent, that does actually happen. What, what adds to this misconception is the fact that the temperature difference between the inside and the outside also strengthens the draft. You will have a stronger draft on a very cold day than you do on a warm day. Good to know about water heaters. As the vent warms up, the draft gets stronger. So if you're looking at a water heater on a warm day in the summertime and the burner fires, it won't draft very well at first. It takes a while for things to warm up for that draft to really get going and for that suction to actually occur. Um, but it does. So that's important to know. We can measure draft and we'll look at that in a little bit. Here's a good shot of an older natural draft atmospheric burner furnace. Here you see the uh, gas control valve discharging into the gas manifold, and the orifices are in a line with the burners, injecting gas down the length of the burner tube. These openings in the end are the venturi openings, and that is where the combustion air is drawn in to mix with the gas. This is where primary air is drawn in. 
And a lot of these burners, you'll actually find a shutter here where you can open and close this opening to control the amount of primary air being drawn in. Here's a shot of what those burners look like looking into that heat exchanger along the tops of the burners. And here we see the flames. Now, uh, you cannot accurately tune a burner just by looking at it. Ideally, you should be adjusting burners using a combustion analyzer. But that is a bit more outside the scope of this course. That's a bit more advanced. And we do talk about combustion analysis in some other classes. But do be aware that combustion analysis is really required to accurately tune any burner of any fuel source, including gas burners like this one. But that's not to say that you can't tell something by looking at the flame, and you can. Now, I'm sure you have heard that you want to see a blue flame, and that yellow or orange flames are bad. But take a look at this picture, especially this one here on the left. You see a lot of yellow here. You see a lot of yellow and orange here as well, and there's orange here. That's not a bad flame. That's normal. This upper portion of the flame right up here isn't really even considered a part of the flame. The flame that we're concerned with are these little itty-bitty guys down here in the center. And when you're watching the flame, we, yeah, when you're watching the flame, if you look for those small, what I call flame kernels, because they almost look like a, uh, a kernel of corn sitting on top of the burner, you'll notice that they have a very distinct shape and outline independent of the rest of this uh, corona around the rest of the flame. That is the, that is the flame that we want to pay attention to. When there is a lot of combustion air, when the primary air is too intense, there's too much of it being drawn in, those flames will be very, very tiny. They will be maybe, oh, uh, 3 sixteenths to a quarter of an inch tall. It will be very sharp and well-defined and very tight. As, combust as uh, uh, primary air supply is reduced, those flames, they will soften, they will elongate, they will get a little bit longer. And a good-sized flame is a soft-looking blue flame that is between a quarter of an inch and half an inch tall. If we reduce air supply even further, those flames will get very long, they will get very wavy and, and wispy, and they will start to mix in with this larger flame corona, and then they will start to get yellow tips, and then we lead to sooting. So you can tell a lot by looking at the flame, but you can't uh, say, yes, it's perfectly tuned by looking at it. A couple of things to be aware of on uh, natural uh, atmospheric burners. If the flame is lifting right off the burner, there's way too much primary air supply. You'll probably find that very down to the very far end of the burner where, like for the last two to four inches of burner, there will be no flame air at all. It'll be just like space between the top of the burner and the fire about that much. As you reduce primary air supply, those flames will boom, come right down tight on the burner, and you realize that there was way too much air in that flame. Uh, so you can tell a lot, but uh, use a combustion and an analyzer for uh, final tuning, for sure. So what about the draft diverter? Here's a draft diverter. Uh, most water heaters have draft diverter. You can tell by the gas valve on this water heater that it is pretty recent. This one here was probably installed within the last uh, handful of years or so, five years or so, five years or less. This opening here is a draft diverter. It should be drawing air in at all times, especially when the burner is firing. When the burner goes to first fire, especially in the summer when the vent and when the draft hasn't established yet, you may find some flue gas spillage where flue product will spill out around the draft diverter. And then after five to 10 minutes of operation, it will pull back in and start drafting correctly. And that is pretty normal. What you want to watch out for, especially on water heater draft diverters, is look for rust on the top of the heater and around that draft diverter area. What that tells you is you have been chronically failing to allow flue products out, and instead they are trying to come out of the draft diverter. 
they are spilling down and billowing around and touching the top of the water heater where they condense their flue products into moisture badly enough and often enough to rust out the top of the water heater. So rust on the top of the water heater is often an indication of a poor draft. That could be because this door that we had to open to get into the water heater area may be closed all the time. It may be a solid door, not allowing that air to come in and draft upwards properly. Or it could be an issue with the flue as well. So combustion air supply and the vent, they both work hand in glove to create that movement of air up the flue. We don't have the combustion air supply, we're also not going to have the draft and that can lead to combustion problems as well. Here's a draft inverter on an old ream furnace. This is a furnace from the early to mid 1980s. Probably a standing pilot. Two burners, here's their openings down here. Primary air involved in this direction. Secondary air joining the flame already in progress. Dilution air coming up at the top of the furnace where the draft inverter is and going up the vent upwards. Horizontal furnace of the same era, same brand. These are going to be found in an attic or in a crawl space. This is a, what I call a dedicated horizontal furnace. And if you are in an attic or a uh, dark and dank crawl space and you do not see the draft inverter immediately in front of you, be aware that the original installer had a choice of where to put it and a choice of where to put the gas valve. The draft inverter and the gas valve aren't always on the same side of the appliance. So in this example, you would be working on the other side of the appliance where the gas valve is and the burners are. The draft inverter is back here. You always want to get back there and look at that draft inverter, even in the dark cobwebs, because there very well could be holes all rusted in it, uh, indicating, again, a draft problem. Look for a big old rust stain under here. Look for holes in the vent connector pipe because attics are generally cold in the wintertime and they're more prone to condensation than, say, uh, a basement furnace would be. So watch out for that. On a boiler, also a very common source of an atmospheric burner. Flames pointing up, primary air joining in the burner, secondary air joining the flame already in progress, draft pulling combustion products up through the heat exchanger, Joining the flue, which is also under negative pressure, and room air joining under the bell here to join the flue uh, for dilution air. Um, here's a hot tip, especially on boilers. Boilers generally tend to be larger BTU input than furnaces do. They need a lot of combustion air, and they very often don't have it. If above the burner area, in this area right here, you see a big stain right here, a big dark stain, looks like the paint has been overheated, looks like there may have been a fire there, you might think to yourself, well, that makes sense. That's natural because there's a big fire right there. It makes sense that that would be heat damaged. It doesn't, actually. What should be happening is cool room air should be moving in this direction. This part of the... Uh, of the jacket of the boiler should not be getting that hot unless flu products are trying to come out the front of the boiler. So if you see that stain, you know that combustion products have been trying to come out the front of the boiler, um, most likely because there is not enough air to supply and support the draft. In that case, the only thing causing those flu products to rise up through the boiler is the fact that they're lighter than air and they will naturally want to rise up, but they will also just as willingly come out the front. So if you see that, get your carbon monoxide tester out and see if you're getting flu products right in that area, and you probably will be. Now go open a window or the front door of the house and open all the doors and you will see, lo and behold, sure enough, that went away because now we are drawing air in. Some of the features of the atmospheric burner plus the natural draft uh, is efficiencies are generally pretty low. We're looking at annual fuel utilization efficiencies of 65 to 75 percent 
A-F-U-E. That might be on the test. All of our flu events are going to be vertical, be straight up and down. There may be an offset somewhere in the middle of the pipe, but generally it's going to be a vertical arrangement. And uh, how much of an offset we can have, all that comes out of the National um, Fuel Gas Code or the International Fuel Gas Code or the International Mechanical Code. The gamma tables or the venting tables need to be followed. You will find problems with venting and drafting if those tables are not followed, and that includes uh, angles of offset, length, distances of offset, diameters of pipe, lengths of pipe, all that stuff is in there. It's very important. You may find the vent be a masonry type, or it may be a type B double wall pipe. B vent, metal bestus, um, heart coolie vent pipe, that's that stuff. Masonry vents are kind of going away. They were okay when there was draft diverters on all the appliances, uh, but we're going to start talking about appliances that don't have draft diverters. And for those, we can't use a masonry vent anymore. Be aware, almost all 80% efficient appli appliances need to have a metal vent pipe. It cannot be vented into a masonry chimney, whether it is a clay liner or not. The way the code works out is that generally is prohibited. Very rarely would you be able to sneak it through. All uh, atmospheric burners with natural draft are considered Category 1 appliances. Category 1 means that the vent is under negative pressure, sucking, and it is a non-condensing arrangement. The flue temperatures will be greater than 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Question, are vent liners accepted? Yes, if they are a listed double wall B vent corrugated vent liner, yes. Uh, um, clay tile liners, according to the letter of the law in uh, the International Mechanical Code, depending on if that's the code that you're following in your jurisdiction, um, are not allowed in most cases. Sometimes they are, but generally, generally not. Um, and my particular uh, authority jurisdiction has pretty much just banned masonry chimneys, period. <laughs> if you can you pull in a permit and there's a masonry chimney ladder, you've got to have a chimney ladder. Next burner we're going to talk about is the in-shop burner with induced draft. In-shop burners, these are common in your 80% and 90% AFUE gas furnaces. In-shop burners, flame, flames point horizontally. They don't follow the rule going up, they go sideways. Once again, just like the natural draft uh, atmospheric burner, gas is still injected into the burner venturi. The primary air is still drawn into the venturi by the same forces. Fuel and air mixed is still, uh, still mixed in the burner tube. There is no draft diverter, however. Instead, now we have a draft blower is located on the outlet of the heat exchanger, and that draws combustion products through. Our natural draft had to be vertical because of that natural suction, but our in-shot induced draft appliances, the flue products move horizontally and they will serpentine back and forth through the heat exchanger. We got to have a fan to pull them through. Here is our burner itself. Here is the business end of that burner. Gas is injected down the other end. You see the open mouth of the Venturi here drawing air to mix with the gas. As it travels through the burner tube, the air and the fuel are mixed and comes out to be a flame down on the end. A couple of things to be concerned with on burners like this is dust and dirt in these corners and that these crossovers are clear of debris and they're not squashed or smashed because there will be a small ribbon of flame along the rings here on the sides, and that's what's going to ignite the adjacent burner. On a furnace like this, the draft inducer is located on the outlet of the heat exchanger. In this cutaway example, the burners are down here, shooting into the heat exchanger. The fan is pulling on that heat exchanger, pulling those products of combustion through. So this heat exchanger also operates under negative pressure, as does the heat exchanger on the natural draft furnace. It's just that now we have a fan 
to pull those combustion products through. Hence the name inducer. It induces you. So uh, if you are uh, a stubborn uh, mule, for example, and I hold out a carrot and I move the carrot along to get you to walk, I am inducing you. I am um, inducing that animal to come towards me. The draft inducer does the same thing in that it, it encourages or pulls that draft through the furnace. It doesn't force it. It's not a blower. It is a inducer. It pulls. Now here is an interesting fact. And this is going to blow you away. Even though this is a fan, and even though the discharge of that fan is going into the vent, into the flue connector, the vent on a induced draft appliance is still negative pressure. Yes. The purpose of the draft inducer is not to force or push combustion products up and through the flue. It's not. The job of the draft inducer is to simply um, deliver the combustion products to the flue. The flue or the vent should still be under negative pressure pulling those combustion products up and out of the house. Very interesting thing to realize. Here's a closer up shot of that same picture is all that is. Now, that was the case for an 80% AFUE furnace. Once we get above 90%, things are a little bit different. 90% furnaces will condense water inside the furnace on purpose to get that extra energy efficiency up. So as a result now, the inducer is often on the bottom of the furnace and the burners are on the top. You can see the serpentine arrangement of the heat exchanger, how that heat exchanger passageway goes back and forth and then up and down and back and forth and then back and forth through the secondary heat exchanger. All the while the draft inducer is pulling those combustion products through that convoluted pathway uh, that it has to go to go through through the heat exchanger. These are built this way to give the heat exchanger more surface area so that it is better able to reject all of that heat of combustion to the airstream that's passing across the outside of that heat exchanger. That's why the draft inducer is necessary and why it allowed for greater energy efficiencies once it started to become adopted in the late 19 uh, or in the mid 1980s. Now, on a 90% AFUD gas furnace, the draft inducer can be properly called a blower because it does in fact blow through the vent. It does push through the vent on a 90% appliance, on an 80% appliance it does not. Here's a better shot of that heat exchanger and uh, draft inducer or draft blower assembly. Notice that on the condensing appliance, all everything from this level downwards from where that secondary heat exchanger is, is plastic. It's because that condensation is occurring inside of the secondary heat exchanger. So from this point onward, the flue brought products are cool enough that they're wet and moist. Therefore, all of the material that directs and contains those flue products needs to be water safe, uh, non-corrosive, and therefore it's made of a, a high temperature plastic. The draft inducer does push through the flue uh, on the 90% furnace, and that flue is going to be a plastic PVC pipe that can either go vertically or horizontally because of that pushing effect. Here's another look at the way those burners move uh, their flame sideways. Once again, here is that Venturi. Now, it's a common misconception that uh, the draft inducer, which is pulling the combustion products through the furnace, also pulls in the primary air. It does not pull in primary air. Primary air is still drawn in through the Venturi effect because of the gas being injected down the burner in this direction. So if there is a primary fuel mixture issue, it is most usually going to be a gas pressure issue. The pressure of the gas causes the air to be drawn in. 
The more gas is pushed in, the more air is drawn in. The less gas is pushed in, the less air is drawn in. In a way, these are designed and built so that you cannot really screw up the primary air mixture on these burners. You may notice that most of these burners, like the one in the picture here, do not even have an adjustment of the air opening for that reason. It is specifically sized to be appropriate within a wide fluctuating range of gas pressures. It will always give you the right ratio of fuel to air. Pretty nice, pretty neat. So in-shot burners with induced draft appliances can be either 78 to 85 percent AFUE, we would call that a mid-efficiency appliance, or they can be 90 to 98 percent AFUE, which would be a high-efficiency appliance. They may be either open combustion or sealed combustion. Sealed combustion simply means that, that the uh, burner, you can't just reach in and touch them. They are sealed, and often on sealed combustion, there will be a dedicated combustion air pipe going directly from the burners to the outdoors to draw in fresh, clean combustion air from outdoors. And that can be present on a 90% furnace or an 80% furnace. It wasn't very common, but there were some sealed combustion, um, uh, outdoor combustion air only 80% furnaces made over the years. That's known as direct vent, by the way. When uh, combustion air is drawn directly from outdoors through a de dedicated combustion air intake pipe, and then the vent goes directly to the outdoors, that's called direct vent. There is no draft diverter. When the furnace is a 78 to 85% AFUE, that vent will be vertical. It will be the same vent that the uh, natural draft furnace had, except it might be a bit of a smaller diameter, according to the venting tables. Why? Because we don't have that extra 15 cubic feet per foot of dilution air going up that flue. So those vents can actually be smaller when they serve a um, induced draft or fan-assisted appliance. If you look at the gamma table, that's known as a fan-assisted draft appliance. Those 80 to uh, those uh, 78 to 85% AFU free furnaces are also category one, which means the vent is negative pressure and it is non-condensing. Must use a metal vent, type B, or stainless steel or a flexible listed and approved metal flue liner. Flue temps on these products are going to range between 250 and 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Notice that increase in efficiency drops flue temperatures, which is why condensation in the flue is even more of an issue, hence the need for the metal liner to prevent condensation. Also combined with the fact that there is no dilution air, uh, we've got to have uh, prevent condensation in the flukes. It's likely to happen unless our vent is constructed to avoid it. Now, I said they're vertical vent. Some uh, of these uh, Category 1 um, induced draft appliances can be horizontal vented with a special horizontal vent kit. And what that entails is there's a special blower located on the outlet of the flue near the outside wall to draw those combustion products horizontally through the vent and deliver them to the outdoors. That horizontal vent kit must be authorized and approved by the furnace manufacturer. You cannot just walk into a house and go, oh yeah, we'll just run that vent right through the sidewall. We'll just go and get a field controls or turn on the sidewall vent kit, no problem. As long as the manufacturer has specifically said that this is the sidewall vent kit part number to use and you use that one, then you're okay. But if you decide to take it upon yourself to invent a new venting system, that's not okay and that is not approved. So make sure you're reading the instructions on the furnace you're looking at. Not everybody follows those rules. So when you're out on a service call, be especially skeptical of a sidewall vented 80% AFUE gas appliance. They are, they are quite rare uh, because they were a lot more expensive to do that way. And um, so many of the ones that I have seen done that way uh, were done um, not by the book. They were done essentially illegally because that's not approved method of venting for those appliances. Some appliances you can purchase a masonry vent kit 
with the uh, 80% appliance to get around this must use a metal vent rule. This is when there's an existing masonry vent or clay tile lined vent, uh, a chimney essentially, and uh, you don't want to have to go through the hassle of pulling a flue liner down that vent or buying a sidewall vent kit and following all the rules about that. Uh, what it basically is, is, a, is an opening in the flue um, that will deliberately draw dilution air in to the 80% appliance while the unit is running. And um, my jurisdiction doesn't allow them. Yours may not care, but do be aware that some manufacturers have that available on some of their appliances. It's not going to be obvious, but if you look carefully in the uh, accessory kit information for that furnace, it's way in the back of the installation instructions. And if you see uh, masonry vent kit, that's what that is. And uh, if you're in a jurisdiction that allows that kind of thing, that can get you around having to drop a liner down the flue. And uh, it can be a lot less expensive that way. But now you have to have that dilution air supply coming into the uh, mechanical room as an air supply source. So be aware of that as well. When that appliance, that induced draft with the in-shot burners is a 90 to 98 percent AFUE, that appliance becomes a Category 4. Category 4 means that it is a positive pressure in the vent, it is blowing through the vent. It is a condensing appliance. These must use a non-metallic, totally sealed vent, such as PVC or ABS or the new polypropylene vent material. Now about that. If you see a natural gas furnace vented with ABS pipe, that's the black stuff. It's the black plastic stuff. They use it on uh, uh, sinks and shower drains and stuff like that too. Be very suspicious. ABS is a thin and brittle material. And when it is used as a furnace vent material, it will crack. So if you are looking at an ABS vented appliance, very carefully inspect the vent. Look for whole, uh, uh, cracks that run along the length of the vent pipe. And they can be quite long, several feet long in some cases. Watch out for that. And you'll need to fix that if you find it because remember that vent is under positive pressure and it's going to be blowing potentially toxic combustion products out of that crack. You may see the condensation stain leaking from that crack, but not always. Uh, these 98% AFUE furnaces will condense uh, their flue products into liquid water inside the heat exchanger and inside the vent. Therefore, it's wet all the time. Flue temperatures will be between 85 and 140 degrees, very low temperatures. Polypropylene vent pipe is the new wave. Uh, it was the old wave. It first came out in the 80s, and they put it in a lot of things, and then there was a huge recall, and it all failed, and it was a disaster, uh, partly because they were trying to use it on high-temperature 80% appliances. By the time 90% appliances came along, polypropylene event had pretty much gone away already. Well, polypropylene vent is, black, is back. It's gray. It's got gasketed uh, joints, male-female connections uh, gasketed together. And uh, it is being sold and marketed to vent uh, high-efficiency condensing appliances, these Category 4 appliances. Cool. We could do a lot of cool stuff with this polypropylene vent that we couldn't do with PVC, and it's a good thing. Be aware, however, not all furnace and appliance manufacturers approve and authorize the use of polypropylene vent with their products. If the installation instructions for the appliance does not specifically authorize the use of a polypropylene vent material, you cannot use it. All installation instructions will give a chart that lists exactly what material is approved for use. And in the case of special vent products, such as the polypropylene vent, it will even call out a specific manufacturer and product name that is approved with that furnace. So for example, if it calls out uh, product ABC to be used at that furnace, and you want to use competing product XYZ instead, you're not allowed to do that. You have to use product ABC. Otherwise, that furnace will not be installed according to the manufacturer's instructions. It's very, it's very particular. You say, hey, what's the difference? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Apparently, the furnace manufacturer thought there was one. That's why they put it that way in writing. 
And uh, if you take it upon yourself to do something else and there's ever a problem, now the furnace manufacturer has no, um, no liability, but you certainly do. So follow those instructions to the letter. If it says you use brand ABC, you use brand ABC. Don't use brand XYZ unless it says you can. And if it doesn't say anything about polypropylene vent at all, guess what? You can't use it. <laughs> so be aware of that. Next up, let me take a pause here. Uh, I'm going to take a pause, see if we have any questions, and uh, take a drink of water. And forced draft. Forced draft sounds exciting to me. Uh, now finally, you know, everything has been drawing, everything has been sucking, we've been negative pressure vents and negative pressure heat exchangers. Now we're going to do some blowing. We're going to do some forced draft. No, not so much. We'll find out in just a second here. Power burners and forced draft. Power burners are similar to oil burners. So if you're in a, uh, in a very big oil market, you know about power burners. It's very much the same thing. But instead of oil as a fuel, it is gas as the fuel. In fact, a lot of larger power burners are designed to operate on both a liquid fuel and a gas fuel. They're called dual fuel burner. Pretty neat. Uh, that way, if there, you'll find them in like a hospital or something. If there is a natural disaster and the gas supply is cut off, They've got fuel in reserve, and they can continue running. Fuel oil, excuse me. A uh, force draft burner or power burner is also known as a gun burner, and we'll see why in just a little bit. Uh, they kind of look like a gun in a way. Uh, in a power burner, flames also point horizontally. They don't go up like this. They go horizontally. And there is a blower, and the blower is located at the inlet of the heat exchanger. Our induced draft products, the blower was located on the outlet of the heat exchanger and it drawed or drew or pulled combustion products through the heat exchanger. Uh, our gun burners or our power burners, the blower is at the inlet of the heat exchanger and it discharges into the combustion chamber, essentially blows into the combustion chamber, hence the name forced in the name draft. Gas is injected into the discharge of the fan to mix with the fuel in the air, and it travels down a tube of the burner with the flame propagating at the end, shooting out horizontally. It's like a giant flamethrower, essentially. Um, however, this might make you think that the heat exchanger and the flue are now under positive pressure, but they're not. They are still under negative pressure. Here's a closer up shot of that burner. Most of these burners are going to be equipped with a barometric damper. And the barometric damper serves the purpose to divorce the flue from the appliance. Remember the flue is under negative pressure. It is, it is sucking. And remember as the air blows or the wind blows across the top of that vent outside, it increases the strength at which it pulls on the vent. If that vent were directly connected to the appliance, it would also increase the strength at which it pulls through the heat exchanger of the appliance. This would have several negative effects. First of all, it would pull the combustion products through the appliance too quickly. Therefore, they wouldn't be able to release all of their heat to the uh, air or the water stream, and the appliance would become less efficient. Second of all, it would pull in more fuel or more air on the burner side of the appliance, messing up the carefully adjusted fuel and air mixture, causing combustion problems. So to prevent all of those bad things from happening, a barometric damper is installed in the fluid. It's usually installed in the T. So that as the flue pulls harder when the wind blows, it pulls with a little damper open. The damper has just got a weight on it, and when the flue pulls harder, it pulls air in from the room, divorcing the draw of the flue from the draw of the furnace or boiler. The furnace or boiler, however, is still under negative pressure. Let's explain that for a second. Here's an example of a... It's called a fire tube boiler with a very large power burner on it. This power burner has a big blower up here, and it is blowing downward, taking air from the surrounding atmosphere, blowing it downward into the burner through the burner tube. Meanwhile, fuel is injected along with that air. Remember, our fuel is delivered under pressure but low pressure. 
So the delivery of this air can't be very high pressure either, otherwise we wouldn't be able to get any fuel to mix with it. Low pressure air. Once the flame is established, the pressure in this chamber goes from positive to negative. Why does that happen? That's a good question. Remember back to the combustion theory. We are actually combining fuel and air together to create new things. What we didn't necessarily say is that the end result, the product, is less than the sum of its components. Think about back to wood again, right? Burn a log of wood. Say a log of wood is this big. Burn a log of wood and you got stuff left over. What have you got left over? Ash. Is there more ash, less ash, or the same amount of ash as there was wood? Well, there's less ash, right? There's less there than there was before. The combustion process transforms and consumes the material. Combustion process almost always happens on a negative. It's why it is self-sustaining. That's why it draws material in. It creates a suction force. As the products are consumed in the flame, there is less remaining than there was initially. That is why in this particular type of burner, when the blower is simply blowing air into the heat exchanger, it is slightly positive pressure. As soon as the fuel is introduced and combustion is initiated, that positive pressure goes to negative pressure. Now the fan's only purpose is to supply the air for that combustion process, and once it happens, the whole flue ways inside of this boiler becomes negative pressure, and that flue product is now drawn out of the boiler just as it was before. It's wild, it's weird, um, and until you see it happen with a pressure gauge on it, you wouldn't believe me, but it's there. So at the flue on all of these power burning appliances, the outlet of the heat exchanger is a slight negative pressure. Now, this is not extremely negative. It's very slight. It's about a minus 0 0.02 inches of water column, but it is negative, and it does pull through the appliance. Pretty neat stuff. Here's a shot of a small uh, residential-style power burner. This would be used in the event that you are uh, retrofitting an oil-burning appliance and configuring it to burn a gas fuel. You would take out the standard oil burning um, burner and replace it with this one. That whole appliance combustion chamber is designed to operate with the force draft system, so we have to give it a force draft gas burner to work with too. And boom, here is a um, force draft gas burner. The neat thing about this little burner is it shows how a power burner is built. So you can, you can get it all in one picture with a small one you can understand how much larger one goes. Here's the fan motor, and in this housing is the fan, and it is blowing down the tube away from you in this direction. Notice gas is introduced into that discharge air stream so that the fuel and the air can they, they can mix in this portion of the burner tube. Flame happens at the very end of the burner, pointing horizontally. There is a opening that can be adjusted with this little adjuster band. The opening is actually around the back of this thing. You can't really see it, but you could stick your fingers in there. That's our primary combustion air opening. Some burners have independent adjustments for primary air and for secondary air. And that's what I was talking about earlier. When tuning a burner like this, you need to have the correct ratio of primary air to secondary air. And to do that, you need a draft gauge to measure that draft and a combustion analyzer to get the right ratio of fuel to air mixture. That's why we talked about products of combustion originally. That's why we're concerned with the products of combustion. When we take a look at chemically and analyze the products of combustion, we can gauge whether or not the mixture of fuel and air was appropriate. If we get too much fuel and not enough air, the combustion products are going to go in a certain direction. If we get uh, too much air and not enough fuel, the combustion products will move in the opposite direction. Levels of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide uh, and excess air will all change, and that can be measured by the combustion anal analyzer looking at those products of combustion. So power burner. Any questions on power burners before we move along?
And we got a couple extra pictures of some big ones. There's a big one. Look at the size of that gas line. That's at least a two and a half or a three inch gas line. See that yellow one on the top? It's a pilot line. That's at least a three quarter or one inch gas line just for the pilot burner. That's a big burner. These burners, these large power burners like this, they have a unique way of firing. I want to talk about this a little bit in case you ever find yourself staring at one of these that you've never worked on before. First of all, be aware that these require special training. And it's way beyond the scope of this um, uh, fundamental type of uh, boot camp style class. But you should have a basic awareness of what these burners do and how they work. So that if you ever get, if, if you ever run into one, you at least have a basic idea. First thing to realize is the combustion air is being drawn in underneath in this example. And there's a damper in there controlled by this arm, which is connected by this linkage to this arm, which is connected to uh, this uh, rod here, which is connected by a series of linkages to some other stuff. This one right here is uh, our, our uh, oil fuel line. You can see that black line there. That's our oil fuel line. This is a dual fuel burner. The other one is connected to the gas pipe. And notice there's a little valve, a butterfly valve, inside the gas line. It's a modulating motor here that controls the rotation of all of this apparatus. When you walk upon this appliance, you are probably going to have some kind of a tool in your pocket, like a crescent wrench or a Leatherman tool. And you may be tempted to start loosening some of these set screws and adjusting these linkages and these rods. Don't. Don't ever do that. Never adjust those linkages and rods, especially not in the result of a no heat call. It's not the problem. Realize that a person with a combustion anal analyzer, uh, very specific training and lots of experience, probably spent the better part of a day getting all those rods adjusted exactly right. So don't mess with them. <laughs> they are where they need to be. Here's how this whole thing works. On a demand for heat, number one, the fan starts. This modulating motor will stroke this damper to go fully open. When it opens, the uh, blower will be generating enough draft to close a pressure switch. That pressure switch will close indicating that we have the ability to move air through the system at full fire. Cool. Then the damper will go full closed. Pressure switch will open, sending a signal saying we will open the pressure switch when there is no flow of combustion air. Next, the pilot burner will fire. These pilot burner solenoids will open, sending gas to the pilot burner, a spark will happen, pilot flame will be established and proven. Then, next, the main gas valve will open. But because this damper is closed and this valve here is almost all the way closed, the main burner will be established with a very small level of flame. Excuse me. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. Once the main burner has been lit by the pilot at a very small level, remember this combustion fan is blowing the whole time. Now this modulating motor will start to stroke to the fully open position, and it will open the combustion air damper and the butterfly valve in the gas line at the same time, allowing that burner to ramp up to full fire. That is a standard uh, startup procedure for a very large burner like this, which is an on-off type of burner. Other burners may be modulated that once they have established flame, they can modulate these dampers and valves back and forth to get more or less fire, uh, but that is not as common. Most of these burners, even though they look like they have the ability to be modulating, generally they are an on-off or an on low high off style burner, a two stage or an on off style burner. Uh, so generally, um, bottom line, if you don't have specific training on these burners, number one, don't mess with them. There's no harm in turning yourself right back around and leaving and saying, I'm sorry, I'm not qualified for this uh, because you're not. And that's okay. 
look at the size of that gas line and imagine how many millions of BTUs, how many thousands of cubic feet of gas are going to dump out of that thing and realize that an error made in working on one of these burners can have disastrous effects, like the building won't be there tomorrow effects. Really bad, serious stuff. Uh, I've seen uh, examples where, uh, not personally, but I have seen pictures of where a big boiler like this, due to a misfire, will actually leave the building. <laughs> They're usually installed in outside walls for that reason, of just a single layer of uh, a block, so that this boiler, if it decides it wants to go for a walk in the parking lot, it can without completely destroying the building, and sometimes they will. So don't be the person responsible for that. Um, we learn to leave well enough alone on big systems like this. But that doesn't mean you can't necessarily have a look. It could be something as simple as one of these pilot solenoids failed and the pilot won't light. So that's why I wanted to be able to bring you to a minimal level of awareness on these burners. But truth be told, to really work on these burners, you'll need hours and hours and hours more training specifically on that brand of burner, how they want it set up. So be aware of that. This is why they're called a gun burner. Doesn't that kind of look like a, like a gun? I guess. Power burners and forced draft are mostly commercial applications uh, or oil to gas conversions. Uh, they're so big they're not rated in AFUE, just like a big commercial truck isn't rated in EPA miles per gallon. Uh, they're normally going to be category one, which is negative pressure and non-condensing. Once again, negative pressure vent. They typically use a conventional vertical vent, which may be uh, steel, may be masonry, uh, if it's going to be condensing, some of these are condensing appliances, it'll be stainless steel. Condensing appliances are pretty rare, though, in that, in that category, but they do exist. The last burner we're going to talk about today is called premix burner, and these are becoming far more popular, um, especially in certain kinds of appliances. Here is a shot of half of a premix burner. You can't see the other half until you disassemble the whole thing. So we'll show you the top half first. Premix burners look an awful lot like a power forced draft burner, but they are not. They are very different. They have some similarities. First of all, there is a fan, there's a blower, and it blows into the inlet of the heat exchanger, just like the power burner did. The big difference, though, is that on the premix burner, gas is introduced to the suction side of the blower, the inlet side of the blower. It is not introduced into the discharge side of the blower. Fuel is introduced to the suction side of the fan. This is a variable capacity modulating premix burner. In fact, that is one of the great advantages of premix burners is they can very easily be modulating burners. And you'll find them very commonly on modulating and condensing boilers, modcon boilers. Um, very common on lots of water heating type appliances. Uh, if you're a Lennox dealer and you're familiar with the Complete Heat, Complete Heat had a premix burner on it. This is a picture of a Munchkin boiler, which has a premix burner, and the combustion blower blows into the burner and into the heat exchanger, with the gas supply is going through the gas valve and being the discharge of the gas valve is on the suction side of the blower. These gas valves actually operate under negative pressure. All of the other gas valves that we've looked at before operate under positive pressure and force gas into the burner. This gas valve operates under negative pressure. What? Well, sure, there's positive pressure in the gas line leading into the valve, but on the outlet of the valve, it is controlled by the suction of the fan. So the harder the fan sucks on the gas valve, the more gas it sucks through the gas valve. So the gas valve is always operating under a suction from the combustion fan. It's very easy for manufacturers to tie a speed control onto that fan and boom, you've got a variable capacity throttling style burner. The faster that fan moves, the harder it sucks on the gas valve, the more gas and air are mixed together 
and uh, the bigger the fire is. The slower the fan moves, the less gas it draws in, the smaller the fire is. It's a modulating burner. Not all premixed burners are modulating, but it's very easy to make a modulating burner uh, pre uh, out of a premixed style arrangement. Because the uh, blower now is literally blowing into the heat exchanger and it's going to blow all the way through the heat exchanger and all the way through the vent, both the burner, the heat exchanger, and the flue are now under positive pressure. It's a completely different style of combustion, which is why I said it'll be tricky. It looks like a little power burner, absolutely backwards compared. Here's the burner. This is what's on the other end of that blower, what's blowing into that uh, chain uh, came this way, and this burner is then actually removed and rotated 90 degrees so it's pointing up. This burner normally points horizontally, and the flames exist 360 degrees around the burner. So that fuel air mixture is blown into the burner like this, and it, it leaves the burner 360 degrees all the way around. Pretty neat, pretty neat stuff. Here's a shot, a closer up shot of a premix burner. Look at all those tiny little holes all around it. Each one of those little holes is a small kernel of flame. Here's what it looks like when it's burning. And that would probably be at full tilt for that burner. That'd be at 100% modulation. Now they only modulate way down, they'll go a lot smaller. Those rods are the ignition electrodes and the flame sensor. And when we talk about our ignition controls, uh, in one of our uh, upcoming uh, lessons, we'll talk all about spark ignition and flame sensing and ignition electrodes and all of that stuff. But that's what those rods are. They're orange because they're right in the fire. They're getting very, very hot. So to review on the premix burner, a blower is mounted again on the inlet of the heat exchanger. Gas will enter the combustion airstream on the inlet side of the blower. So yeah, that squirrel cage, that rotating blower, has gas and air being mixed right in the fan. That's, that's kind of neat, kind of crazy when you think about it. The gas valve operates under negative pressure, and the blower draws the gas right out of the valve. Our premix burners, they may be modulating, like I said, or they may be on-off style, or they may be two-stage. The on-off style and the two-stage burners are going to be found on very large commercial boiler style appliances, such as a, uh, a Patterson Kelly boiler or a Camus boiler. Those are uh, also uh, rate pack modulating vertical boilers uh, use a premix burner as well. So those are some very large capacity, multi-million BTU input uh, boilers. Small footprint though, they'll still fit through a doorway, kind of neat. These are very common on modulating and condensing boilers and they may be either a category three or a Category 4 certified appliance. Category 4, as we said, is a positive pressure vent condensing low temperature flue products. Category 3, we haven't talked about yet. Category 3 is a relatively rare bird. That means that it is a positive pressure vent, but it is non-condensing, high temperature, such as those bigger boilers that I just mentioned are often Category 3 appliances. So that brings us to the conclusion of our introduction to gas heating systems, fundamentals of fuel gases in their properties, fundamentals of combustion, and the basic construction of the most common types of burners and draft systems that you will find in the field from a wide variety of applications from residential, forced air, water heating, hydronics, commercial, and industrial style burners. And uh, we are right on time of our end time. We generally shoot for a, uh, a, a three-hour session, and we are right about that three-hour mark from when we started. So I would like to take a minute and thank you all for your attendance and your participation. If you still have any questions lingering that you didn't get a chance to ask, now is the time to ask. Um, so I will uh, stay on the line here for a while and monitor the chat box, see if there are any other questions. Uh, remember uh, that we will be back here again next Tuesday for session two, uh, same time, same place. And uh, at that time, I will be on the air, on the line, one hour early for Q&A session. So if you have questions regarding today's 
lesson that come to you, say, tomorrow or later on in the week, you can come to the uh, uh, session uh, up to an hour early next week and uh, ask your questions and get the answers then. And that will also be part of the recordings and part of the replays uh, for those of you catching this on the replay. So, everyone, uh, thank you very much once again, and good night. I look forward to seeing you all back here next week. And as I said, I will stay on the line just a little bit longer for any questions. If you don't have any questions, have a wonderful night, have a wonderful rest of the week, and I will see you all next week. Thanks again.